Shauna McGuire is a New York Times bestselling author, but also is a horror author, a Magic the Gathering double threat, having written for both the canon and the Boom comic series. She also owns several mancoons and praying mantises or mantees. I actually had to look that one up on Google. She also owns hundreds of My Little Ponies for an incredibly touching reason that we delve into. And that's great because she also happens to be the subject of today's interview. So without further ado, let's get to Shannon. So my youngest cat is 10 months old now. So she's still in that age where you're counting, but she's a Maine Coon. What does that mean? Maine Coon? A oh, Maine, Maine Coon is a breed. Yeah. The Maine Coon is the largest breed of domestic cat. They are the only North American land race breed. And a fully adult Maine Coon can weigh between 28 and 35 pounds. No. Yeah. So as a 10-month-old kitten, she is already a 15-pound cat. She is bigger than most adult cats and is full of wasps because she's a kitten. Oh, um, so they can get that big and then I, I, you, you can't, you know, decline them isn't a thing. So doesn't that make them sort of like very dangerous? Oh, yeah. I have three of them. How, how does that, how do you not end up getting like... And like that just that just to me sounds very really dangerous. I like, mean, it it can be, but that's sort of like the question of how do you have a large dog and not get your arm ripped off? Oh, it's true, um, but that's why I stick with Shih Tzu's. <laughs> the worst injury I've had recently, you can't see it in this lighting, but there's a scar down the side of my jaw. I got from the smallest of my cats when one of somebody else startled her and she just bounced right into my face. I saw the photo of it, I think, on Twitter that you took. Yeah, that was Verity. She's itty bitty. Come here, sir. I'm going to pick you up because I, I need to show you uh, to someone who has not seen a grown up Maine Coon. Come here. Come here. Oh, nope. You're going to go away. Okay. Bye. Um, so, I mean, and I'm, right away, I can't help but notice the, the amazing stuff you have going on in the background. I was like looking, I was sort of like, you know, photo stalking on Twitter, and you, mm -hmm. your, your place is like, um, it's like a dream, like, store for like fantasy people like it's everything's so laid out and so organized but yet you've got such a massive collection of things i mean uh i mean like that poster in the background is i'm arrested by it for whatever reason of the three women i think it's three women that are on, in a poster. oh that is um that is a terry pratchett poster that's the Discworld family values that they did so it's oh, death wow. and his family um, oh wow Oh, wow. That's great. Okay. So, well, we officially haven't started, but you know, I'm going to leave this stuff in anyways, because this is okay. fantastic. But, um, I wanted to uh, just thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Oh, of course. And um, so I've got a lot of questions to, to start with you, but I, what was the first, Stephen King was your first, like, real awakening, or at least that was the first, the first time you read him, you were nine years old? Yeah, I was nine. That um, seems early. I mean, well, it reading. was. But, you know, like a lot of very nerdy children, I was a, an early reader. I read early and I read big. And since a lot of libraries, at least at the time, would put limits on how many books children under 16 could check out at once, yeah, I right. learned to go for the thickest books possible. It wasn't about what, what is the book about. It wasn't about content or quality. It was about what will take me the longest to finish. Mm -hmm. um, so the first long book that I finished, you should do two fingers for that, but the first long book I finished was Watership Down, which had been filed in the wrong part of the library. That's an intense book. Way more traumatic than I think our school librarian realized. That one I was eight for. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, that's dark. And Stephen yeah. King, I, I knew his name because he kept having movies made and TV shows, and I was very excited. Uh, and I really wanted to read him, but my mother said no, because she had heard that he was scary and he wrote scary, upsetting books that would not be appropriate for small girls. And I don't like being told things are not appropriate for me. So I basically went on a propaganda campaign for why she should allow me to write to read Stephen King, culminating in a 14 page essay with footnotes and citations at the nice. age of nine. Are you serious? Um, I am serious. She still has it. Uh, it is not very well written, but it is as long and as ridiculously elaborate as I am implying here, explaining why she had to let me read Stephen King for reasons of literary uh, 
you know, literary value, the things I had already been allowed to read, which were generally accepted as being worse than Stephen King in a lot of ways, uh, the cultural import of Stephen King, like just the whole thing, really annoying. Uh, and her response was to hand me a copy of Christine and drop the topic, just like, please stop. And, and so Christine was your, that was the one, that was the, the one that broke the floodgates then. Yep. Christine was my first. Um, I can't say that I liked it very much, but because I had fought so very hard to be allowed to read it, I read it and then just moved on through the oath. It's, uh, I think my first one was Carrie. That was my first book. And uh, it's, it's so, I still can't believe that he was going to throw that in the garbage. Like he had thrown it away and his mm -hmm. wife said, this book's going to work out. You should not throw this away. So yep. around how early were you discovering, I mean, I'd imagine it was about that time too, you were discovered you were a writer because you were writing manifestos on Stephen King. At <laughs> yeah. Your mother. I mean, what was the first story you ever wrote? What was your first like? So there used to be a TV show called Ray, called Ray Bradbury Presents, which was an anthology show. And every week they would adapt another Ray Bradbury short story to television. And uh, I, I got so mad at Ray Bradbury Presents, like irrationally angry in that way that only children can be, because every episode began with the credits that included this older man sitting down at a typewriter and pulling a sheet of paper out of the typewriter and throwing it into the air and it would waft down and become part of the logo. And I was infuriated by the existence of this man because he was using up a good 35 seconds that could have been story time. So I asked my grandmother at the age of, I think, seven, you know, what that, not what the hell, because you didn't talk like that with your grandmother, <laughs> but the equivalent thereof of what the hell is this? Why is he here? Why won't he go away? And she said, well, that's Ray Bradbury. He wrote all these stories. And that was the first time I had considered that writing stories was allowed. No. I think that was kind of the moment where I understood that fiction was a thing. I had just assumed everything adults told me was true up until that point, because don't lie was such a firm initial commandment of being a well-behaved child. And I was a fairly well-behaved child. Um, so I started writing when I was about seven. I did not write well. Uh, most of what I wrote early in was fan fiction. Um, I had a lot okay. of adventures with My Little Ponies. Okay, okay. Me and the ponies, we did a lot of stuff. Because when you're seven, you don't know what a self-insert is or why you shouldn't write one. Your toys are functionally alive anytime you sit down to tell a story with them. So you're just transcribing what you genuinely feel like you did that day. Um I mean, it's, I mean, when you say not written well, I mean, like comparatively, like comparatively, but I, I would imagine you compare your writing to the uh, average seven year old or, or, and it probably was, it probably was good compared. I mean, comparatively, I, it almost certainly was at least because I was putting energy into it. You know, almost so, everything is where did you put your energy? And so when was the first time that you were paid as a writer? What was the first story that you got a paycheck for your writing? Uh, the first story that I got a paycheck for my writing would be Lost in the anthology Ravens in the Library, which was put together by um, Phil Bricado. And I, I know his co-editor, but I can't remember the last name that she published under for that one. And I don't want to be insulting and leave her out when she was just as much a part of that book if you want to um, if, you want, if you want to look it up i my editor uh, Nathan San, yeah sandra buskirk it was oh, uh yeah. it came out january 1st 2009 technically i had already sold my first three books but because anthologies can publish faster phil was able to get that out and he got credit for my first publication he was very proud of himself that's really uh, cool I, you know <laughs> I and mean, you're prolific like Stephen King. And it, it, it's like, uh, how many hours a day do you write? On I am a word count writer generally. So I get up in the morning, I sit down and I start writing and I keep writing until I reach my daily word count goal, whatever it is at that time. I'm a little bit squirrely right now because we're in an editing phase mm. where I'm not actually writing. I'm sitting down with books that have already been written and uh, and editing them and trying to make them suck less. 
<laughs> and, and that is an essential phase. You have to edit. It's, it's so important. Um, until and unless you are Stephen King, editing is not optional. It really shouldn't be optional for anyone. But I can kind of understand on some level, especially for the older authors, like once you're 70, I, I already don't want to waste time editing. I just want to write a book, wander off and write another book. Like, <laughs> can we just do that, please? Right, right. Ah. Uh, so I'm squirrely right now because I am not tapping the maple syrup out of my brain. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just word count. And that can be anywhere from two to eight hours, depending on what's going on that day. Wow. That's that's intense. So, that, so like, explain to me how um, you, I mean, because you've already been, you've already, you know, have been established a successful writer when you you got involved with magic was yeah. that something that was spearheaded by yourself did you play the game beforehand how did you get involved with the stories that you eventually ended up writing for them so i've been playing magic since alpha okay like i've been here for a very long time uh though oh. i did leave for a while i used to do uh, tournaments in northern california I was one of the only female players. I was never great, but I was solid enough to be middle of the pack. Uh, and then my middle sister stole most of my deck and sold it for drug money. No. And, yeah. And since by that point, not only had a lot of early staples that you kind of needed to be competitive in the Legends era, uh, gone out of print and become prohibitively expensive to a 17-year-old. Um, but... I didn't have any money. I could not even buy new cards to trade to try to get them back. Uh -huh. uh, so I dropped out for a while, but I came back. Um, and I did not seek out Magic the Gathering uh, in terms of working for story. I do a lot of licensed IP work. I did a two-year run for Marvel Comics on the Ghost Spider comic. Really? Uh, okay. Yeah, really. And uh, I would kill a man at Marvel's command to get her back. I honestly would. Uh, so Marvel, hey, the murder offer is still on the table. Would you kill a woman, though? Is the I question. would one hundred percent kill a woman. I would kill anybody Marvel asked me to if they would just give me my <laughs> comic back with a guarantee. <laughs> would you, uh, but would you? But you, you would not kill a mancoon, right? We can't. We got to. I, I, I no. There are limits. Yeah. I can't kill a cat. Can't it, kill a child. I'm with but, you. I'm with uh, you. If they came to me and said, hey, we just need you to commit one teensy weensy murder and we will give you a legal team and your comic back with a guaranteed five years publication, I would already be on my way to wherever it is the person was going to be. Good I have very little pride when it comes to that. I mean, um, teensy weensy murders, they happen, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. But Oops. I've done some short fiction for Alien and Predator. I wrote the first YA alien novel, um, which was so, super fun i really enjoyed it um, so, so cool. i originated in fan fiction and licensed fan licensed fiction is not fan fiction but it has enough similarities to scratch some of the same mental itches uh so when grace fong who was a story lead at magic she was the set designer for kamigawa neon Di not set designer the set lead for mm -hmm. kamigawa neon dynasty and phyrexia all will be one I believe she was the original lead for Outlaws of Thunder Junction, but I don't want to say that with absolute certainty. Um, Grace Fong approached my agent and said, hey, would Seanan like to do some magic fiction? Uh, and do you know who the actor Christopher Walken is? I've, I'm, yes, I'm aware of his work, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Christopher Walken, in an interview a long time ago, said, I am phenomenally lucky to be able to do what I do and have that be my job. Yeah. Millions of people want to do what I do, and most of them will never have the opportunity. Because sure. it is partially, it's partially talent, partially skill, and partially timing. And you can have all the talent in the world, but if the timing never lines up, you don't get to be Christopher Walken. Absolutely. Says, you know, I am phenomenally lucky to be able to do what I do. So I have a policy of saying yes to things. And you can see that throughout Walken's career. Any offer that he receives that he can fit into his schedule that is not actively insulting. Yeah. He will accept. Yeah, that is very true. Looking at his cat, like thinking through back at his catalog, it's mm -hmm. like he, he does. Ha he had. It's very strange. Very, I wouldn't say erratic, but like maybe eclectic. It's of, eclectic, of, of, absolutely. And I try to take 
that approach to things. Like I know I'm lucky to be able to do what I do because I know that a good chunk of it is due to factors that were never inside my control. Um, so if someone approaches me and says, Hey, do you want to do a thing? And it's a franchise I have any affection for whatsoever. I will generally say yes. I do make the fran the affection is mandatory for me. I have mm -hmm. to care at least a little bit because fans and readers can tell if you don't care. And no one is nastier than a franchise fan. I say this as a franchise fan. Oh, we yeah. have very firm ideas about what things are and what things ought to be. And if you get it wrong, we will eat you in the street. Yeah. Um, it's true. And it, it is, is true. it is entirely possible to have very different opinions about the source material with the same information provided. Yes. You can't see the shirt I'm wearing in this lighting, but it actually says Nahiri did nothing wrong. I have to ask you about that now. Okay. Nahiri, you and I, I'd say we are now, and I, I don't want this, this is not adversarial, but I, let's just say politically of, is worth Nahiri, we're on standing on different sides. Now That's I am fair. fascinated uh, by your affection for Nahiri. You, you truly love her. I do. And, and it is shown throughout your work, obviously in the comic and even, I, I mean, I don't know how much say it, it you had with her popping in with the Johnny, but even there, but just, and the way you've you, you voice you know publicly about it. So why did Nahiri? Why do you feel like she did nothing wrong? Well, the shirt actually fully says Nahiri did nothing wrong to Soren. <laughs> Nahiri has done a huge amount of things that are very very wrong. She has committed war crimes. I do think it's interesting that if you look across almost any franchise, but specifically Magic: The Gathering, the dudes who have committed war crimes, we forgive. We forgive Would, again and again. Who you do will we still, forgive, though? You I mean, will still find people that will absolutely argue that Mishra was, was right in everything he did, that Urza was anyway. right in... I know that Urza was right in everything that he did. Sarkhan basically wiped out an entire uh, reality, <laughs> and way. people are on his side. What Soren did was selfish and can selfish, be considered yes. genocidal by inaction, but people are madder at Nahiri than they are at him. A lot of my sympathy for her in specific comes from the fact that she was an old walker, which means that when she sparked, she stopped aging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at the first illustrations we have of her, the earliest cards. And tell me how old you think that girl is. I'm guessing maybe 20s, like early 20s. 17. Wait, which really? She's a, she's a baby. Nahiri is a child when her spark awakens. She is a literal child. She is not yet, we don't know what her trauma was, but she is not a fully formed adult. She starts planeswalking, which we know in 95% of cases, we only have one confirmed uh, exception, is the result of severe trauma. Yeah, the only yeah. exception is, is Amanatu. Although I continue to say Tyvar's trauma was that his brother forced him to put a shirt on for his coronation. <laughs> I um, know you can't make him cover up his abs. He's well, just who will look. Note that he did not realize he was planeswalking. Clearly, whatever <laughs> happened did not upset him that badly. But so she has just experienced an unspecified trauma severe enough to awaken her spark, doesn't know what's going on, and runs into Soren Markov, who basically turns her into a guard dog. Everything she knows about planeswalking, she learned from Soren. I would I would state and have stated in public, and this is my opinion, not the opinion of Wizards of the Coast. Right, right. Though right. some of the story leads at Wizards have learned not to leave me alone in rooms with certain people, that Soren Markov should not be allowed within 500 yards of a school. Wait, what? That was he did not physically touch her, but that was child abuse. That was grooming. I, you think that Soren had the, like he had feelings for Nahiri? Like he I don't just think he had feelings. Her. I don't think he actually crossed that line. But I think that Soren Markov was abusive in the things that he told her were normal for planeswalkers. And then the <laughs> fact that he left her on Zendikar, never came to visit. And that is, that is canon. That is not my interpretation. Well, yeah. That, that yeah. she was shut down on Zendikar. No one came to check on her for thousands of years. 
Just, well, Ugin didn't do anything either. I mean, Ugin gets off a pretty, he gets oh, off. Yeah. Like, I mean, U Ugin was dead for a good chunk of that. But yeah, no, I'm mad at him too. They just don't push Ugin on me as the sexy vampire boy that I should support and forgive. But um, didn't you name one of your um, your uh, prank mentis to Soren, right? I did. I did. Because I tend to just kind of rotate through planeswalkers with them. <laughs> Um, and Soren got to have the best death that a plane that a praying mantis can have. He died of being exceptionally oh. old. Oh, I'm sorry. The, yeah, because I, I not I would I saw that you did an interview ten months ago. And I, I'm not. I don't know the, what the life. They live about are. ten months. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, sorry. No, no, sorry. it's fine. I I love my mantises. Uh, praying it's mantises, weird. especially the larger species, are tiny alien intelligences that you can they're interact so strange. with they're so strange looking it's i mean i know they're from this planet but like mm -hmm. you get this feeling that like maybe they couldn't have come from, from somewhere, somewhere else. else and when you look in their eyes you can actually see that they are recognizing that you are a thing they, they learn who their handlers are they learn their surroundings they're very charismatic little bugs and they're very individual Soren was kind of, um, well, he was arrogant, but he was also very flamboyant. He wanted to come out of his enclosure and sit on your hand and flare his wings and just be like, look at me, I'm so pretty and so cool. And everyone would ooh and ah. Sarah, my female praying mantis, didn't want to be handled at all. Mm. If you could get her out of the enclosure, she would try to go to the underside of your hand and hide and then go straight back into the enclosure. Aw. My That's current mantis, cute. yeah, it was it was cute, but they were very different people, even right though on. they had had the same environment. Uh, my current mantis, Narset, who is of a different species, is too young to have really decided how she feels about humans yet. Uh, she's a Papawa giant blue mantis, so she'll be about yay big when she's fully grown. Oh, wow. And a really pretty shade of turquoise. I'm excited and, for her to get there. And there isn't... Uh, the, the, with the cats and the insects, there isn't like a constant like having to make sure th things aren't killing each other kind of thing going on. Because I'd imagine the cats are just naturally kind of like, I could eat that. You know what I mean? Like, oh, the cats would love to eat them. <laughs> I just have to be very careful about where I keep my enclosures, where I put them and all of that. Um, so I I don't, to, to kind of back it up a little bit, I don't think that Nahiri should have attacked Innistrad. Like, that was not cool. But it is a facet of the old Walker philosophy. You know, from her perspective, Soren left her plane to die. So she's punishing Soren rather than the people of Innistrad because non Walker, non planeswalkers, if you're having an old Walker mentality, die in 15 minutes. They're like Pringles, they're here to go. Um, she should not have done that, but she was very, very mentally unstable at the time after being locked in the hell of vault in absolute darkness and sensory deprivation for hundreds of years. I, yeah, you know, I wondered, but the way you kind of pitched it here, I'm wondering if maybe Nahiri Spark might have had to do with mental illness. I mean, what you could imagine, right? If you're dealing with mental illness, that could be something that could trigger a spark. I mean, if you have an episode, yeah. Why not? Right? So I mean, speaking as yeah. someone who occasionally gets to help make those decisions, I would not want to have our first canonically neurodivergent, other than Narset, Planeswalker, have their trauma being the mental illness. That well, becomes okay. really ableist and problematic very quickly. Well, it's not, I didn't mean that oh, I no. didn't mean it in that in that manner. And I just was sort of spitballing like that could be something that could happen. Not that I but I don't, I don't mean to be ableist. If, oh, I don't if, think you are being ableist. I just like killing Chandra, which I think is about as likely to happen as uh, my room suddenly experiencing a rain of frogs. I would love a rain of frogs. Please do that. You would. Uh, but killing Chandra is not necessarily bury your gaze. It's not necessarily a bad trope. It depends on how it's done whether it's earned and why it happens. Yeah. So yeah. having a planeswalker whose spark ignites in part because of a mental illness or a bad mental episode is not inherently ableist. It's all in how it's handled. Nahiri right has not been super well handled traditionally. Right. Like we, we have right. not given her a lot of balance. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's, talk to me more about that. I found that very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm. This is the first time I've had somebody able to speak to me about Nahiri, where I'm not like horrified by her actions because that was that was my initial reaction mm -hmm. to her. 
And because I because I see what the, happened to the people of Innistrad and I think, oh, yeah, what did they do? That but look at not only look at what happened to the people of Innistrad, look at what happened to the people of Zendikar. I agree. I just I I just feel the the stuff that happened to the people on Innistrad was just so much more gruesome. I guess the Eldrazi's the way they kill or the way they change or whatever they do. Mm -hmm. I feel oh, like Emerald uh, is the gnarliest, I guess. I don't know yep. if that makes sense. Moon Mama, she's having a time. <laughs> but um yeah, where is she by the way? She's we, in we the moon. To, we need to talk to her soon, I think. It's uh it's time that she shows up. I just throwing it out there into the universe. Yeah, she, cool. she is she's chilling in the moon. I did enjoy the period during All Will Be One when people were going, oh, they're going to complete Emrakul. We're going to get to see completed Emrakul. And I'm going, okay, do you really want Phyreasis via Wi-Fi? Because that is what you get if you complete Emrakul. You, you get know, Phyreasis via Wi-Fi. <laughs> that is hysterical. Oh, my God. That's funny. Wow. Okay. Do you know, I, my theory was is that if Emrakul actually was unleashed on the Phyrexians because the, the whole thing where she – um. What, like if the soil was not ready for her, it would do bad things. So mm -hmm. what if like she could un I, I thought they were gonna use her to unphyrexianize. Like maybe that was her magic trick that she you know goes and turns the Phyrexians into back to organic. That was my theory. It did not pan out, but I thought no. it was a worth one. I thought it could have yeah, worked. That could have worked. That could have been a fun one. I mean, there are always there are always the routes that you're like, thank God we didn't completion <laughs> via Wi-Fi. And then there are the routes where you're like, no, that might actually have worked better. That that could have been a lot more fun. So, so you get involved with the story now. Exp talk me, talk me through about the like how how the process goes. You you show up. I'm like, I'm just imagining you show up to work at the office. You know, Wizards of the Coast, handy dated pen in hand. And how does the creative process go down uh, as far as going from ideas to you writing the thing? So the actual composition of story is one of the last things that happens. And that is in part because cards have to be play tested. Cards take time. Uh, story is not instantaneous, but it is faster than designing an entire playable card set that does not unbalance the game, has any sort of synergy with everything that's come before it, and is going to make players happy. Uh, so initially when I came in for my first set was in a midnight hunt, which is mm -hmm. why we have the less than perfectly attractive, uh, werewolf scroll oh, yeah. on the wall behind me. Oh, that's uh, Arlen. I, yeah. There. I didn't see that because it was, you were blocking it, but yep. it's, uh, uh, anyway, go on. As you were saying, it's a good you scroll. Um, so they asked me to come in for Innistrad midnight hunt. I said, sure. I signed a whole bunch of non-disclosure agreements. I've done work for Lucasfilm. Wizards of the Coast has more aggressive non-disclosure agreements than Lucasfilm does. That's interesting. That's that's very interesting. You know, well, I mean, I I too I too have an NDA because I interview enough people that if you know, like there have been times where people have have oopsied during uh -huh. an interview, and, and I'm like, don't worry, we'll cut it out, and it's yep. never going to see the light of day. But yes, uh, they 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 are very protective of their IP. Yep. Um, so. You, you, you get it under lock and key. So I guess uh, then without violating anything, obviously. And oh, tell me I'm, whatever you can. I'm explaining the process, which does not involve the NDAs. Just you sign about a billion NDAs. <laughs> they then send you a very well done, very detailed world guide to that specific set, which includes a lot of internal development art that honestly, I don't understand why we're not printing these world guides after the sets come out. I know. I go out of my way to come up with excuses to acquire every world guide I can since well, I'm under things. NDA and I just want to look through them. I just want to see there's stuff that you can't it see. Sucks. It sucks. It's like they're, they're works of le legitimate works of art. They really are. So you know how in um, March of the Machine, you could find the Phyrexia logo worked in almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it was very blatant. It was very out in the open. A mm -hmm. whole lot of sets have something like that where they're like, here's the motif for this area and here's how to find it in the art. It's like, where's Waldo? It's <laughs> freaking gorgeous. Oh, um, wow. So yeah. they send me the world guide. Um, I read through the world guide. The world guide is confusing as all hell. I spend about eight hours grilling various Vorthos that I know and hanging out on the wiki to find out 
what am I missing? What pieces do I not have? Um, a lot of the writers, we check in with each other to find who's your favorite. Who do you like? Because then I can go to you directly when I have Sarkhan questions and just be like, right. okay, so I don't feel that I get Sarkhan the way that you do. Can you explain to me why Sarkhan is cool here or whatever? Um, then, since you're generally brought in, to, you're either brought in to do main story or to do side stories. And if it's side stories, they already know what the side story is roughly going to be about. So for mm -hmm. Midnight Hunt, I was brought on to do two side stories. I had Teferi and Ren in the woods, and mm -hmm. there were no dialogue samples on Ren at all because no one had previously written her, which sure, yeah. sounds fantastic. And like, look at all this freedom you have, but is also extraordinarily stressful. And yeah. then uh, Gisa and Wilhelm. Wilhelm, yes. Wilhelm. Well, loads of fun. I mean, um, and... I think you gave Ren a great voice, but BT dubs. I'd say thank you. She... I enjoyed her a lot. Um, Gisa has turned out to be my niche. Like I'm the Gisa Sasani go-to girl. Okay, that's fine. I love Gisa. Um, she, but so she in all the good ways. She is Magic's very own Harley Quinn. Like she is that yeah. that same kind of crazy without the redeeming. I could be a good guy. I don't think there's any world where Gisa Sasani is a good guy. Despite that, I will argue to the death that Gisa and Garolf are in Estrad's greatest heroes. They inadvertently do that, do that, don't they? Yeah. They, 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 anytime, they accidentally save the day. Anytime they team up, they save Innistrad. It's true. They are. So they are, um, go Sasanis. Um, yeah, right? But, <laughs> Funny, they're like a weird little antivirus to like the stuff that happens. Right? So you're given your situation, which is that we need Gisa to meet this new legendary character who is going to be the face character for our Zombies Commander deck. And he had a crush on Gisa, and you figure it out from there. Um, I then go into the outlining stage, which is, I use what are called Punnett Squares. Uh, okay. You may have heard the term from like breeding pea plants or. I um, can't say I have because I, I, I've not bred pea plants, at least for a good never. I've never right, it's a school thing. Um, generally, a punnet will be. Uh, is this pencil working? It will be a, qu a question about pencils, but it will generally be a set on an axis where you have just your four squares and it doesn't matter if it's working or not because you can't see anything in this lighting and then you drop dominant traits from the different things oh okay all right i think i know what you're talking about yeah, yeah all right i'm with so, you i'm with you if i know i'm working in a limited space i'm working with gisa and wilhelt and there i just need things that could happen with them i'll set up my punnett squares and i'll have two different big inciting events and then a couple of different variations and pitch here are the four ways that this could go so i do that they they choose which one of those is the best suited and make any changes that they might have and then i go into drafting and drafting is um simultaneously my favorite part and the part where I am the most annoying uh, because I get to sit here and just write, but I have whoever my story lead is. Uh, currently it is mostly Roy Graham because Grace Fong has sadly left the company. Yeah. Um, so I have my story lead, which is one of the only people who is inside my NDA and can thus talk to me during this process. Right. Um, and then I have Jay and Ellie, who is the overall mm -hmm. lore master for magic. Yeah. And so I am on their Microsoft teams all day because I would rather get it right the first time. Yes. Just hitting yes. them with snippets of text, asking them questions. There are a remarkable number of questions, even in a side story. And doing a main story is the same thing, only bigger. Mm -hmm. um, our, our length is very firmly set. That's in the contract. How many episodes you get, how long the episodes can be. Uh, and then when it's done, I turn that in and uh, Wizards forgets about me for about a month. And then the editors that they have and their sensitivity readers come back with any notes, anything that is out of character or counterproductive or whatever. I make the changes they've requested um, and we move on to publication. Now that NDA I told you about, the really aggressive one, technically it is a violation of NDA for me to say 
that I have written anything that has not been released if Wizards has not said that I'm the one that wrote it. Okay. All right. So then did you just accidentally violate your No, idea? no. Your those own. have all been published. But okay. it means I, I did not work on Ixalan. Um, I am not the right fit for Ixalan. But if I had written for Ixalan and I said doing a side story for Ixalan was like this too, that would be an NDA violation, even if I told you absolutely nothing other than I wrote something. Okay. So like you, like you, it's like a future. Yep. That's, that's intense. It is. It is. And we have no control over scheduling. So like the all will be one story started running while I was in the middle of book tour for a different project. And that was incredibly stressful. And I hope that never happens again. Oh, that must have been um, intense. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But uh, so for story development, which is something I have also gotten inv involved with a couple of the writers rooms where we pitch future years, they will come with the planes already chosen. They will come to you and say, okay, we are finally going back to Arabia. You know, we're going to Innistrad. We're going wherever. And they will give mm -hmm. you the set designer surface level, um, which has been locked in because they've already started designing cards. Right. And then we will eat. Everyone who's in that room will pitch a different version of how that set could go to hit the goals that it's supposed to have and lock things down. And we wind up doing a lot of development on those year-long arcs and trying to make sure things are contiguous. We've got a really great writer's room right now um, because we all talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, I, I just I, I interviewed Kira and I just like, I, she's fantastic. I oh, love yeah. that. Have the two of you on together just to like watch the tete a tete, you know, going on with with the, like the way you guys are. Because you writers, you you guys are so much fun to, to listen to because you're very good at speaking because you write. And so it's, it's like listening to well-crafted paragraphs in conversation. It's it, Kira and I are good friends, which is useful, though her eye is astonishing. I sent her a uh, housewarming gift when she moved into her new apartment, and I took a picture of the crap I was sending her, and it's just a pile of stuff on the bed. There's a T-shirt. There's some things I've harvested from game stores. Bunch of cards. Bunch of cards. In the background of the cards, mostly covered by other cards. So you could see like this much of it. There was a um, revised scrubland. Oh, it's... wow. Some damage on the back. So it was actually extremely cheap. But if you're playing yeah. sleeved, it's still usable for commander. Mm hmm she spotted that thing in a second and a half and just started yelling at me. Is that a scrub land? Is that a fucking scrub land? I'm like, yes. I find dual lands in shoe boxes. It is, uh, Shivam Bot says that I'm a leprechaun. He <laughs> is not wrong. I literally picked up a box of random magic cards at a Goodwill that had most of Portal Three Kingdoms in it. <laughs> like, I am the penthouse letters of, uh, of Goodwill shoppers. I never Good. thought it would happen to me. Okay, wow. Uh, what's the most ridiculous thing that you've ever found at Goodwill shop? I mean, what's the most like, like, I just to sidetrack? I mean, what, what, like, what? The box of Portal Three Kingdoms had two Imperial seals before they had reprinted it in Double Masters. Ooh, um, so that is probably the most ridiculous thing, monetarily speaking. Yeah. The most ridiculous thing in just terms of what the hell do you mean? Um, I will buy random collections at Goodwill or yard sales or whatever, and then pick through them and sell them so that I can afford my magic habit. That's <laughs> one way to buy more cards that you actually want to keep is by liquidating old collections and trying to keep things going there. And uh, a friend of mine pings me on discord and goes, Hey, you sell magic cards, right? And I'm like, yeah. Do you think you could sell my cards for me? I need money. Do you think you could make me a couple bucks? And I'm like, well, I can try. Do you know what you got? And he says, well, they're all in the, the, the attic at my parents' house, but I'm pretty sure I have a Black Lotus. And I'm like, no, you don't. No one who says that ever has a Black Lotus. Everyone uh, had a Black Lotus in high school. No one does. Um, right. right. So he goes to his parents' attic to retrieve the cards. 
starts sending me pictures of himself, you know, holding the cards the way that we do. He has not washed his hands. He is not wearing gloves. The first card he sends me a picture of is, in fact, the goddamn Black Lotus. Oh, you're like, oh, oh, God. I'm I, I, literally my sphincter. Like, yeah, exactly. Clamped. I'm like, you need to put that down right now. Do not touch anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but it had a Black yeah. Lotus, Mock Sapphire, a bunch of dual lands, a huge chunk of Arabian Nights that had all just been sitting in Velveeta boxes in his parents' attic for 20 years. Oh man, that is, that's, see, that's madness. It's amazing. Like these, it's like the, 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 um, the, the amount of money that, like, that that was just sitting in a Velveeta boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I have helped him pay his rent for like a year. Uh, yeah. I mean, I actually got a chance to hold the original oh, Black Lotus magic game. cards, but that's why occasionally you are on my Oh, we still have the Black Lotus. The Black Lotus is in my dollhouse because that's the place no one would think to look for it. Um, it's in a very secure, the, magnetically locking case. Okay. In the doll, well, like um, in the doll, <laughs> in the dollhouse. It's like, <laughs> that's, it, is, that, is that like literal or is that metaphorical? Oh, that is very literal. Oh, wow. You got quite a dollhouse. See, that is, I mean, I don't, it's like, you're the most, like, it really is like, you you have this incredible, like, uh, museum of things, like, in your, in your uh, place. Do you have, do you own any original art by chance? I do. Or what, what do we, what do we own? I, I mean, I, I, if you're not, if you're comfortable talking about it, I know people are not Oh, necessarily... I'm very public about what I have. I am not super concerned that someone's going to rob my house for my original art because my original art is not the most desirable in the universe. We're in a hallway now. Do, 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 do. <laughs> but over there, we've got the, the Tyvar Kell original from Aftermath. Oh, cool. My handsome boy. Um, he is my favorite planeswalker. Really? Yes. And then here, we have the Tyvar Kell original from Phyrexia All Will Be One. Yes. Yes, it, that's... Now, that's um, interesting. Tyvar's your favorite. I, I would yep. not have guessed that. Those are some comic covers from yes, the Boom Comics. The, yeah, that's the, the cover. Yeah, that's that my Nahiri, uh, which I'm very proud of. And then this is the Ryan um, Gonzalez that she did for Lost, Last Planeswalker. And then that is my only actual original card art of Nahiri, is that's the pencil for Nahiri's Warcrafting. Wow. Oh, wow. Look at that. That's uh, That's beautiful. Yeah, just random stuff. That's, I mean, and everything's framed so well. I mean, I have, I, the only thing I have original painting, I have the vampire token from Edgar Markov. I have the oh, original. Oh, nice. Yes. It was, I found that on Volkenbaga's website. It was, it was, I got to buy it through him. I was like, how would nobody want, how would nobody grab this thing yet? Oh, frequently I'm surprised by that. And then my friend, Amy Meberson, who did the My Little Pony comic for quite a while. Yeah. Um, every time I start working for a new IP, she will do a picture for me of the characters from that IP welcoming me to it. So that's the picture she did when I started working for Magic. You can see uh, Tyvar is thrilled by the selfie. Nahiri is not. Yeah, she's that is that's fantastic. Oh wow, it's very pleasing. And then I guess if you could, if there is a piece of artwork you could own, if money was not an object, and you could get it. Which one would it be? I would re so um, as we discussed early in this interview, as I walk back through my house, doot, 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 um, I started playing really early. Yes. And yeah. my favorite magic artist that I never got to meet uh, and never will was Quentin Hoover. Mm. Yeah. So I am fairly reliably on the watch for any piece of Quentin Hoover original artwork. Um, because I, I know they're expensive because he was beloved to a lot of people and there's not mm -hmm. going to be any more. But yeah. if something eventually comes up and I can afford it, I will. Um, I probably won't be able to because you said, oh my gosh, um, magic art either goes for way less than you think it's going to or way more. Uh, when I held the original Black Lotus, I was sweating bullets because I knew how much it was being sold. I think it sold for five million and I, I, was holding it for an interview and I'm like, can somebody take this mm -hmm. from me now? I, I don't feel comfortable touching yep. it, but I don't want to touch it. Like I'm sweating. It's, it was an incredible honor. Oh, fucking intense because yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, like I don't, it's like, I'm like, I don't, I, I won't be able to afford 
the how like if I drop this thing, like I think I'm broke for like several lifetimes. So yeah, no, you know, it's like yeah, so my primary collection of things is not actually magic art, it is generation one my little pony. See, um, now that's now the My Little Pony thing is interesting. I remember like the thing that I remember the most about them as a kid, my sister had them, was mm -hmm. like you scratch their booties and they would smell good. Uh, there were a couple of sets that did that, yeah. Like any toy line, like magic cards, if it goes on long enough, they're going to start trying to come up with gimmicks because that is how you keep people buying. They didn't all smell good though. Like, didn't they have like good smelling hair? I remember them being like fragrant. Mm -hmm. like, it's, they were not that... they were not all fragrant but the ones that were fragrant like all toys of the 80s you remember the fragrance um, yeah right? we had was a probably carcinogenic plastic <laughs> that we would all huff the second we took them out of their boxes because oh my god yeah yeah not, a, not 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 it's not untrue there probably was like you know probably you know going to die a few years earlier thanks to huffing my little ponies as yep. an eight-year-old but the room across the hall from the one that we are currently in is entirely filled with My Little Ponies. And I would take the computer for a quick tour of it, if not for the fact that my youngest cat desperately wants to eat My Little Ponies. That is like her life goal right now. Uh, and I cannot juggle the computer, open the door, and keep the cat out of the room. If you'd like, if you after the interview, if you I want to send you photos, pictures, yeah. and we can, we can juxtapose them in because, I mean, I'd love to see the My Little Pony room. I mean, it's it's... It is just, it's fascinating to me. Like, what, so what do you think it is about the My Little Ponies? I know, I know like it was like the last unicorn was like the, the impetus, right? For, mm -hmm. for like sort of starting it. But what do you think it is about My Little Ponies that makes you so drawn to them? Uh, so let's get bleak, kids. Uh, okay. I grew up in the state of California uh, on welfare, so far below the poverty line that we did eat out of dumpsters and we did make choices between soap and paying the power bill oh, um man. that there were not very many good adults in my life uh and as a consequence you could not have gifted me money you could not look at little miserable eight-year-old me who hasn't eaten in a day and oh, give me twenty dollars it was just not an option if you did that one of the adults that had authority over me would take it away um you also oh. couldn't give me anything that had resale value you couldn't give me a fancy Barbie because you might be able to sell that for 10 bucks. You couldn't oh. give me a thing that could be taken and sold. Uh, my grandmother, who was one of the few exceptions to the very few good adults thing, figured out almost by accident that My Little Ponies were incredibly sturdy. They didn't break. Yeah, they were. They, were. they had no resale value at the time. Mm -hmm. Even a brand new pony that had been out of the pack for a minute, you could maybe sell for a dollar. So no one would steal my ponies. No one would mess with my ponies. If my mother had a bad boyfriend at the time who liked to break my things, which was not uncommon, they couldn't oh. break my ponies. The ponies were untouchable. They, yeah. they had hex proof and invulnerable. You know, they <laughs> were the perfect thing. So my grandmother started getting me ponies when I was four. And they represented love and safety in a way that nothing else in my incredibly fucked up little life did. Um, oh. Ponies were a constant. They were also a reason, even when things got way bleaker than we need to go into on this podcast, mm -hmm. uh, they were also a reason to stay alive. That's, that's beautiful. I actively suicidal by the age of nine because of some of the things that were going on but oh. every pony would come with a little booklet telling you what other ponies were coming out that year and i would very frequently go you know what not going to kill myself today because if i stick around i can get princess royal blue oh that that's that is i mean that's that's heartbreaking but that's beautiful that 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 mm -hmm. i mean that they were an anchor for you like they really were and I still love them. And at this point, my collection has gone from collecting to conservation because they are 30-year-old pieces of plastic. Uh, the pony that I'm casually waving around at you, he's in really bad shape. I just got him from England. But this is about a $500 pony when he's not in shitty shape because there he's are so few. Shape. He looks, I mean, looks his good tail and mane have both been whacked off and his symbol is barely <laughs> visible. Um, oh. So he's going to go to a restoration salon and get fixed up. 
And technically that destroys his value because his hair and paint will not be factory standard, but he will look just fine. And he's going to go live with the rest of his herd. Uh, and I don't care what they're worth. They're my friends. Right. Um, you don't, you're not getting rid of them. They're, they're, oh, they're, no, they're, I am going to die. And then someone's going to have to deal with 8,000 little plastic horses. Uh, Bonnie Zacherly, who actually created My Little Pony, knows who I am, and that oh, wow. creeps that creeps me out on a regular yeah. basis. Really? Like, yeah, that, it, it is upsetting. Why well, is it upsetting? Knows, that would be cool. Her knowing who I am means I can disappoint her. I don't think so. I don't think that. I don't think that that's something that you. Like, what you just told me now. I. I mean, how could that be? That you don't seem like somebody who would be a disappointing My Little Pony uh, like person. It just does, that doesn't. Think well, I, think. I don't think I'm going to, but I'm allowed to have anxiety like anybody else. Of course you are, but I'm just I'm just saying that was a beautiful story. I mean, like that was. I hope that she, if she heard, I hope she's heard that because that's. I mean, you don't stop and think about that kind of thing. That that, that these you know toys that people often you know like dismiss they say oh you know it's weird or like you know i've been accused of like th similar things like with hoarding or they say it's hoarding behavior and i say no there's actually reasons why people do it that are not you know pathological that that's it's a beautiful thing that you just told me that mm -hmm. that these these ponies literally like you, you were able to stay afloat and they they saved my life. Um, I have met both Bonnie Zacherly and Peter Beagle, who wrote The Last Unicorn, and they are both a beautiful example of me of you know it is okay to meet your heroes. Right. They so. are one. If you ever have the opportunity to spend an afternoon with Peter Beagle, he is exactly the man you want him to be. He is <sighs> so kind and so thoughtful and so considerate of the world around him. It's. Um, it's such an epic story too. Like, yeah. the, I mean, like, and I, I love the, I mean, even love the movie as a little kid, you know, like I, I just, I, I don't, I don't know how you feel about the movie adaptation. Of oh, it it's wonderful. Movie. See, I think so too. It's, it's gorgeous. And um, I'll never forget like the, you know, the depiction of like, you know, like my five-year-old self, like getting the introduction of what a harpy looked like. It was kind of like, just, it, it's, it's so, it's, it's, it's he's great yeah, yeah i've not spent an afternoon with him but i have had uh been fortunate enough to meet some of my heroes and had good experiences with them so i know exactly what you're talking about when you have somebody that you might meet that you expect them to be that person and they are and it's like yeah okay maybe the world exists for a reason at this moment in time like it's it's a magical thing um I want to know, I won't keep you much longer because I know you've got a busy schedule, but I'd love to know your favorite bad book that you've read. Like, okay, for example, my favorite bad writing book, but I, I loved it, was Valley of the Dolls by Jacqueline Suzanne. Mm -hmm. Like, I know it's total crap, but it was so good. It's like eating a bag of, you know, chocolate covered peanuts or whatever. It's just like, it's garbage, but you can't stop doing it. Do you have any of those guilty? Oh books? yeah. So there was a publisher for a while. They went out of business. They deserve to go out of business. I'm pretty sure they didn't pay their authors for years, uh, but they were called Leisure Publishing, and mm -hmm. they basically operated on the paperback of the Month Club uh, principle. They had Leisure Horror, Leisure Westerns, Leisure This, Leisure That, and they would just send you a book of whatever that you were subscribed to. I love Leisure Horror more than is healthy. Um, leisure horror novels are the literary equivalent of those terrible schlocky B movies that would come on your local ca cable access station at 10 PM. They are the stuff and critters in book form. Uh, except I think that both the stuff and critters probably have more merit than many of these books. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. Um, that's, um, I think were they list, were they meant, I, mean, I wonder if some of those were in that recent book paperbacks from hell where it had a lot of the artwork. No, from, they came uh, after about the paperbacks from hell era paperbacks from hell you're looking at more like the guy smith era okay um, and harry knight and and that sort of thing and and i have a lot of those too that are not great yeah it's like they're trash like but you you but still they're my love trash right right you're allowed to like trash i love so, mean, i love trash too it's it's a, i it's a am thing. not recommending this book uh, I would like to specify that very clearly in large capital letters because presumably people might listen to this and, and think, yes, this is not, not recommending this book. It is not a recommendation. You're allowed to like fucked up shit, but you it's don't true. have to. 
Yes. Uh, yes Robert yes. Devereaux wrote a book which was published through Leisure Horror called Santa Steps Out. And it is a 365 page new weird splatterpunk horror novel about Santa Claus fucking stuff. Wow. Santa Claus fucks the tooth fairy. The elves <laughs> run a train on Mrs. Claus. There is a sequence with ejaculating on a Christmas tree that I read aloud every holiday season just to upset people. Oh, um, that's a nice tradition. Yeah. It, oh, it's great. Well, sometimes we'll do a live stream of just, I'm going to keep reading aloud from Santa Steps Out until I can no longer keep a straight face. How long can you read it before? At this point, read? I can get through the whole book. No. Oh, donate you, you, to charity. Because I've read it, it so many. I didn't rehearse it, but I've read it so many times. But here's the thing, and here's why it is my favorite book. It is an impeccably written, absolutely flawless Jacobian tragedy. The language choices throughout this book are chef's kiss perfect. The sentence construction is gorgeous. The pacing works really well. The subject matter is repugnant. It's like going to a Michelin star restaurant and having them serve you a pigeon and dog shit quiche. Like oh. it's not okay, but it is so brilliantly written that the contrast to the subject material just makes the whole thing transcendent. That makes that I understand what you're talking about. Like it's a conundrum because it's like the the actual like the, what's happening in the book is total garbage, but the way that it's being pr presented is classy. Yeah, and that's that's yeah. It's hard not to fall for that kind of stuff. I I, I agree. It's it's if you especially if it catches you you know during formative years, it's. You, you have an awakening to a trash and it happens. I mean, yeah. but I, 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 I will, I will confess I'm going to have to read it now. I That's will not okay. be, I will not be judging any care. Like you are not the books you read, you know, mm -hmm. like, so, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm cause if, if you're saying this, it's, it's not like it's a glowing review, but it is fascinating enough that I'm curious to know. Oh what? yeah, I I had a back when I actually did book reviews, I had a whole category called the one star you must read this. Oh, that sounds is, fantastic. Yeah, basically this book is trash. You should read it. Um oh. a lot of mid-70s British science fiction falls into that category. Oh my uh God. there's a book called Denver is Missing by an author whose greatest talent was titles. Uh <laughs> where we're drilling in the ocean and we punch into a methane hole. And so suddenly a huge methane glass gas cloud basically envelops the earth. But since methane is heavy, it just suffocates everyone at sea level. Oh. And so it's people going up the clouds, trying to, to, to get above the toxic air and survive. And it's bad. It's just bad. Oh, that sounds I like me and my favorite Mexican. Yeah, I, I pretty much killed brain cells by reading some of these books. <laughs> You know, if you had more time, I know that your schedule is jam packed, but I swear to God, if you were able to do a YouTube channel of like that one star, you must read this. Like I would subscribe so quick because I, I would, would love. Yeah. It's one of the few things I have considered because be most so of those cool. authors are dead. Okay. <laughs> but, but I mean, like to, to, for a New York Times bestseller who's so well spoken and just so obviously just so good at what she does to, to be like, look. I guess I, because a lot of times people don't want to admit that they like mm -hmm. trash there. There's a shame to it. And it's, I find it not just refreshing, but the fact that you like actually actively did this. I mean, God, that would be a killer YouTube channel. I mean, yeah, it is interesting how much we want to continually morally purify the media that's gone into us. Yeah. Mm. And I can understand, don't recommend things that you haven't watched or read recently. Absolutely. Because sometimes the suck fairy comes when you're not looking and yeah, you yeah. discover in a rewatch that something is Way a different. lot more morally questioned. Like Revenge of the Nerds was one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. Yeah, me too. It presented this world where being smart was cool and yeah. someday we would win. And then I tried to rewatch it as an adult and I'm like, wow, it's this isn't some... just, it's not just that it's homophobic and, and kind of mean it's rapey as all hell. It is very rapey. It is very rapey. Although interestingly enough, it did have the, a, like a gay, a gay black character in it, which was, I mean, pretty like progressive for the mm -hmm. time. 
it's it's weird. It's like the eighties had a lot of that going on where yep. it was like one step forward, two steps back. Exactly. And, and like, yeah, and he's it. intensely stereotyped and not okay. Yeah. But, but I do remember seeing him on the screen and thinking like, okay, wow. I mean, it, I, I rooted for him because there right. was just not a lot of gay people that were considered part of the gang, you know, and I guess, yeah. And it's, him being gay may be part of why he winds up in the nerd's house, but the nerds never judge him for it. They, they didn't give a There's, shit. There's never a point where they're like, oh, no, I can't change clothes. You might see me or any of the other stuff that you take. Yeah, none of that, they were not homophobic towards exactly. him at all. It was, it was that, I think that's one of the endearing parts of the, of the mm -hmm. film. Was, you know. But yeah, it's, it's super, super rapey. It's, it's a yeah. shame. But. So while I still do have affection for that film because it did get in so early, I'm not going to recommend it to someone who is watching based on today's standards. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. Because uh -huh. things are, I mean, things change. They definitely change, and it's 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 especially for. I, I mean, I'm assuming that I consider myself sort of like you know, analog to digital. If you were somebody who grew up with a telephone wire, and and then you grow up, and all these changes happen so fast, it is hard to keep up with what mm -hmm. what what is considered to be. Um, acceptable versus not acceptable. And I'm, you know, people, I think I have, at least I'm constantly worried about accidentally offending right. or saying something that is considered, you know, gauche. And I'm like, I really had no idea. And I think that people sometimes are not tolerant of the fact that ignorance is, is not always like yeah. ignorance is, is not the same thing, right? Is, is, uh, As malice. Ignorance. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. We're also not super forgiving of the fact that you can't edit the past. Yes. Yes, I agree. Totally. Um, my father is Roma. The single piece of Quentin Hoover art that I would most like to own is the Pradesh card from Legends. Because I think if that piece of art is going to exist, it should be in the home of someone of Roma descent. When I was in high school, I ran a red-green deck that had four of that card in it. In part because um, my, my classmates were much more aware of anti-Roma racism than is the standard for American high schools because really? they had me. Um, and they wouldn't kill them. They just like, okay, she's got four forest walking two twos and we can't stop that because we're racist if we kill them. And I was 16. I took full advantage of that. <laughs> but, um, you know, the standards <laughs> change. If you decided to go back tomorrow and reread my entire body of work from the beginning, from the very first book, mm -hmm. you will find that in the earliest books, I use a lot of ableist language. A lot. Uh, yeah. No one had ever said the phrase ableist language to me. That wasn't even a word. I think. And that sounds unrealistic today, but... In 2009, 2010, that conversation was just starting and it was very easy not to be engaged. It's 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 shocking, really. I mean, one thing that I discovered that I did not know by looking at your Wikipedia today is that uh, that I did not realize that tweets are considered to be acceptable citations for references mm -hmm. of like of, of your of your bi your bi biography. Like you tweeted uh, something about. Uh, having OCD, and yep. that is then included in your Wikipedia as a citation. Which, I mean, I'm I, you tweeted it, and I'm glad it's true for you and all that stuff. But that that's kind of insane to think a tweet could be something that is used as a reference. I mean, I mean, tweets can be used in legal action, right? Uh, right. But yeah. I have had people who were told, "Oh, she's a very progressive writer. She's very inclusive." or just she's working for magic, she's working for a franchise you care about, decide that they're going to go back and read one of my books so that they can figure me out. And they'll grab a book from 2009 and hit me using words that I actively would not use today. And then basically rage quit me in public, which is very performative. Uh -huh. It's a thing people do on social media. We're like, just, yeah. you said this author was great. I think that she's a bigot. She yeah, used right. this word and that word and this word and that word. And you can find them on Twitter too, because I was on Twitter before I was part of this conversation. Um, it's so that's unfair. It's such an unfair, it's very unfair. We're very bad at the passage of linear time. I had yeah. someone get mad at me because I wrote a couple books that involve a roller derby player as the as the narrator. They're part of my encrypted series. And oh, I had man. somebody get mad at me because I dead named Elliot Page. What well, well 
And I'm um, like, no, no, I, I didn't. Right. I used the name that Elliot Page was using at the time. He had not yet figured out that he was a man. Um, right. There is a right. big difference between time has marched on and this author wrote this thing today using someone's dead name. Yeah, that's that, that that's that. I mean, I don't want to say that that is ridiculous, but that's ridiculous because that's that's sort of like, I don't know. I mean, this is a poor comparison, but like if I am able to walk on my two legs today and then I lose my legs in an accident and then somebody talks about me, you know, like it would be like trying to say, oh, well, you're not being sent to the fact that that he's a, a, a person that's handicapped or, or whatever. I don't even know if that's the right word. But in any case, like it was not a, it was not true then, you know, I was not in, in a wheelchair then. So then how would that it's it just, I, that person just is just right. wanting to start a fight. But these are still important conversations. I'm glad we're pushing them forward. I am super proud of the fact that across all of Magic the Gathering's history, we've had to ban like eight cards for being racially or culturally insensitive. Yeah, and then there which, are, there's, yeah, some of them, and some of those that were banned were pretty damn, well, you know, we know. Yep, yeah. yep. Um, I'm genuinely proud of us for that. And the improvements in the fiction you know, I have a lot of the older books and they're not bad. They were well written. They were, but yes. They are frequent they frequently fall into the at the time acceptable epic fantasy pattern of right. women exist to be rewards for men. Yeah. Um, everyone's heterosexual, everyone's yeah. able-bodied, disability or disfigurement are signs that someone is evil. You know, we've got all of these bad old tropes, but they're in books that came out 25 years ago. It's not their fault. Yes, yes, exactly. It's it's you have to like you do have to take into consideration that thing that things were different then. I mean, it's it's not an excuse. It's it's just a reality. Yep. It does not put, let get people off the hook. It does not it, it does not allow people to continue to write that way, right? It, you shouldn't be allowed to continue to right. write that way. But that particular piece and that particular author, they may not necessarily be that person today. I feel like, for example, I know that, and I won't say his name because he's the one Magic Gathering artist that I do not care to interview. But he did do the um, the uh, the one of the banned cards that, let's say, the the intention was to evoke the Inquisition, and really what was evoked was the KKK. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I have heard from people who worked with him that he was not always that bad. Like they, there was a decline in. Their, their their personality and they became more and more obsessed with you know like idolizing you know hitler and, and whatnot and and so it just goes to show you like you could meet somebody at one point in time that was decent and then watch them have a dissent just and the same that somebody else can be wrong at the beginning and then not continue to do the same thing which is what you said sounds like you said you've done it's like you don't try to continue the the negative things that you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. It's important. Um, but I, I just think that we should look at timestamps on everything. Um, for Phyrexia, all will be one. My sensitivity readers were on the whole great, but we had one sensitivity, re one. I don't know who they were because I don't get that information. One sensitivity reader that didn't want me to use the word black in a descriptive context because they thought it was always negative because I was talking about things on Phyrexia. And I'm like, yeah, but the Black Thane, that, that's his freaking name. Yeah. The Black Thane. Necrogen is black. Like, yeah. th th I'm, not, I'm not saying black magic or black deeds or any of those older phrases. We're very good about avoiding those. But right. things are still that color. Your shirt and my shirt are still black. They are not yeah. the color of spilled ink. Like, you can only avoid yeah. so much. Yeah, it's that is, that's... <sighs> That's, that's a little too sensitive, maybe. <laughs> and that's why that's why no single editor controls everything. We have that's a copy true. editor, a story editor, and a sensitivity editor, and our story editor will protect us. Well, that's I mean that's that's uh, that is that's some, I, you know that that must that must take a lot out of you. I mean, like to be somebody who is because I I read through your stuff and I thought, wow, you are incredibly a uh, woke. It, not, I don't mean that pejorative sense, but you seem mm -hmm. very aware of what it is that you're writing, and, and to hear that even you get pushback, it's, 
it's mind blowing. And so that must be difficult to hear people call you things that you aren't. I mean, that's not nice. I, I think it's partially frustrating because I am I am aware and I am paying attention. Yeah. Uh, but frequently the first criticism you receive will be at top volume and accompanied by slurs because someone who has already been hurt and thought you were a safe space has just gotten punched by your work. Oh. And it can be hard to listen to someone who's screaming at you. That's like, terrible, though. That, you know, it is terrible, but it means that people like you know Stephen King or anything like that who are at a high enough level, they only hear the screaming; they don't hear the conversation. Yeah. And so there's this nasty tendency to double down, and King has never done that, thankfully. Um, but he is fat phobic as all hell. I'm a huge <laughs> fan of his, and uh, my friend Meg El Meg Ellison, who is also a writer, wrote a big essay about the fat phobia of Stephen King. And I read that and I'm like, yeah, that is all correct. I, I recognize that. And then went and read one of his short story anthologies. And literally every single story had someone whose evil, wicked awfulness was signaled in some way by their fatness. That's, oh, wow. I have to think about that. Well, you know, it's like, but at the same time, like, it, you know, well, there people have their people have their foibles it does not make stephen king a bad man no he's, he's not he's and like, i would like, still happily have, have dinner that. with him oh god i mean that would be awesome that would like, be awesome it would be i mean i would be sweating bullets but you know it would oh be, i would it pass would... out in my soup his on writing book i read that in college and it's like so brilliant i mean like the i mean people do not quite get how really truly great like I mean, oh, yeah, he's very successful, but I mean, he's really going to be talked about for thousands and thousands and thousands of years if, if we make it that far. If we make it know. that far, yeah. On yeah. writing is brilliant. Um, yeah. It is my favorite book about the craft of writing. Brilliant. Yes, absolutely. Though we one hundred percent disagree on television. We're, oh well. I watch well, an obscene amount of television. It's oh, the only true. way to That's turn right. my brain off so that I can sleep. Oh, I do fucking King's awesome. like stick a fork in the electric socket, see how far it'll go. No, I wonder. I wonder if he still is like that now because TV's gotten so good. I mean, it really has. It's like mm -hmm. since the eighties. I mean, come on, like, oh, oh yes. Oh my goodness. Well, I thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Yeah. I could literally, I could, I could talk to you for so much longer, but I know that you've got stuff going on. But um, we'll have to. Uh, I'll, I'll have to have you on again if you, if you Absolutely. will. Absolutely, you were lovely. It's been a blast and uh, enlightening. So, oh, good. I am glad to be helpful. And uh, thank you so much again. And you have a pleasant evening. You too. Bye. Okay. Bye.